We started out in a room at Andrews Field in Maryland in 1946. We had a box of filing cards, a blackboard, and a telephone. There was nothing out here in Nebraska then. Just prairie. Back there at Andrews, our job was to keep track of about 600 old prop-driven planes and three P-80 shooting star jets left over from World War II. There was something else left over from World War II the full knowledge of what strategic bombing could do. And to increase the already awesome force that could be launched from the air, there were suddenly nuclear weapons. Add this to the long-range rocket developed in Germany in World War II, and maybe you can understand the kind of problem we faced in 1946. We had to count up all the weapons, planes, and men we had available. We had to keep in touch with everyone so that the men and the planes we had could be used effectively. That got to be a pretty complicated business. So they designed and built this headquarters for the Strategic Air Command. Security precautions here are tight. They have to be. There's more in this building than a box of filing cards, a blackboard, and a phone. We're not just keeping track now of five or 600 prop-driven planes and 38,000 officers and men, or the uncertain enemy threat with which we began. I think there are almost that many people working right here in this installation now supporting a complex system that handles more than a thousand long-range missiles and jet planes, besides keeping track of what's happening around the world. When you finally get into the SAC command post, and you can't just walk in, you can see the surface, at least, of a very complicated system designed to counter a very highly developed threat to peace in this world. We have to assume, you see, that if any potential enemy knew in any detail how this SAC command and control system really worked, he could beat the system and attack us at will. So you can't just walk in here and look around. Our blackboard has become six big display screens, four of which can be split into quarters, giving us 16 different computer-fed displays. Our box of filing cards is now a computer, storing millions of bits of information and processing new data for display in less than four seconds from the time it's reported in. That some system, some box of filing cards, some blackboard. The nucleus of the SAC command post is here at the senior controller's position on the main floor. The senior controller is a colonel he knows SAC. He's been an aircraft commander. He knows the men, their planes, their weapons. Then there's that telephone. The original telephone replaced by a whole new system in color. This gold telephone gives the controller a direct line to the president, to the National Military Command Center in Washington, and to other major command headquarters. The red and gray phones make up SAC's primary alert system. On the red phone, 
SAC issues direct orders to more than 150 missile control centers and to 50 aircraft command posts spread throughout the world. The only response to a red phone directive is electronic acknowledgement. Through the gray line network, the SAC controller can carry on a two-way conversation with any SAC unit. Through a high-frequency radio network, the controller can talk to any SAC aircraft in flight anywhere in the world. It is over this, or an alternate radio network, that the president's order to go into combat operations would be passed to SAC airborne crews in time of full-scale nuclear war. The SAC command post deep underground at Offutt Air Force Base is also tied into the ballistic missile early warning system. The MUSE, as this system is called, monitors missile approaches to the United Kingdom and North America. Information picked up by Bemuse radars is automatically processed through computers and displayed in the command post to alert control teams of any attack. This information from Bemuse and other warning systems tells us how dangerous any potential threat might really be, the number of missiles to expect, how soon and where. Next to the senior controller and assisting him is the operations officer controller. From position number four in the command post, this major or lieutenant colonel, who has also held most typical SAC assignments in the field, monitors and controls all aircraft and missile operations. He makes all transmissions over the primary alerting system. And he also has an assistant, two in fact, Operations NCO controllers. These top-level sergeants have had wide experience in various SAC assignments. They're well able to monitor SAC flights in the United States and to help the senior controller and operations officer controller monitor or keep track of and control all SAC missions overseas. At the other end of the command post console, an officer and an NCO keep a close watch on the availability and replacement of parts and supplies, weapons, ammunition, all the things needed to keep SAC forces operational around the world in peacetime or in war. Another officer NCO team in the communications section controls the SAC Worldwide Communications Network. This system includes telephone and teletype ground lines linked to low frequency, high, and ultra high frequency radio, all of it tied together. So we can stay in communication through every possible emergency. So that's just a kind of surface look at the rather complicated systems that have replaced the basic equipment with which SAC began to perform its mission over a quarter of a century ago. On a routine day like this one, not much may seem to be happening here. But even in the calmest moment of their most uneventful days here in the SAC command post, these men are responsible for the essential elements of our strategic air command strike force, right, we'll command right control. Major Bertram, will you give us a maintenance test of the primary loading system? Skybird, this is Dropkick with a maintenance test of all stations. There will be no authentication with this maintenance test. Acknowledge now. Dropkick out. The system has certainly come a long, long way from where it began. The force these men are held accountable for is the most powerful ever mounted and not used. It includes the bomber and tanker crews of the SAC alert force, always on 15-minute ground alert, ready to head for targets they've been trained to hit. A thousand minute man missiles standing by, over 50 Titan II missiles ready. Unlike planes, which can be launched and then recalled, Missiles may have to ride out any initial attack on the United States. Only in retaliation to an enemy strike at us 
would our nuclear force ever be launched? Yes, it's quite a system, all right. But it serves the same purpose we've always had in SAC, command control. It serves to tell the men who have to make the ultimate military decisions in any emergency exactly what force is at their disposal, where it is, and what that force can do. The system tells these men even more how the force they control is reacting to orders as they are given, how that force can be redirected or recalled as the situation it moves to counter changes in any way. This place is three stories below ground level, a big rectangular vault made out of reinforced concrete two feet thick. It is almost secure from attack. And the thousand people or so who'd be stationed here in a real wartime emergency would probably subsist for the necessary length of time to maintain effective command control of the SAC force. But should this and all alternate command posts on the ground be lost, SAC has an airborne command post called Looking Glass. Looking Glass missions are flown from Offutt Air Force Base by EC-135C jet stratotankers. Ever since 1961, there has always been one of these aircraft in the air. An airborne command post complete with communications equipment. Manned by an experienced team of controllers commanded by a general officer. Looking Glass, in effect, mirrors its underground counterpart and can assume full direction of the SAC bomber and missile force. This airborne command post assures that SAC's command control system will survive any initial attack and be able to execute the command's emergency war orders at the direction of the president. Yes, sir, it's some system, all right. Up in the air with Looking Glass, are down on the ground, 46 feet underground, I should say. In time of war, you know, the SAC commander-in-chief and his senior staff members would sit right up there. From here, if our safety was threatened, he'd launch the SAC aircraft force. The presidential direction to strike would come in on that phone through the National Military Command Center in Washington. This balcony would be filled with people then, the panels alive with urgent displays, the phones alive too. Down on the floor it would be the same, alive with men, taut with the tension under which we'd move, reluctantly but efficiently to full-scale war. The beauty of this system is, you see, that another world war is exactly what all this has been designed and developed to prevent. It's normally pretty quiet here, with just the sack cadre of officers and men going about routine duties, keeping track of things. The system was designed to keep it this way every day. All this is evidence, not just of our technical virtuosity or of our military strength. This room is an outstanding example of how America's tremendous power and its technology have been put to work to keep peace in the world. For here, in this underground command post, and in its airborne counterpart, is centered the strength that for over a quarter of a century has helped to prevent a major war from engulfing the world. That is the ultimate significance, and the really very simple meaning of all the complex equipment and the communications and computer systems with which these SAC officers and men work in the SAC command post every day and every night. All this ties together aircraft and missile bases with the warning system along the perimeter of our world to defend the United States against an attack and to deter the use of nuclear force throughout the world. All this is no small thing to have accomplished in a single lifetime.
If the evolution of this room and of the system centered here hadn't kept pace with the complexity and power of weapons in the world today, who knows? If we hadn't kept one jump ahead of the threat we faced throughout those years, and we did that here, from this room, who can say in what kind of world we might be living today?